Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Dubs Lecture. Welcome and thank you all for coming. It is a particular honour for me to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, Peter Tatchell. For those of you attending this event for the first time, you may be interested to know a little bit about the event and the remarkable stories that have brought it about. The Dubs Lecture was created in recognition of the remarkable life and career of one of our school's most distinguished Old Laconians, Alf Dubs. He attended Shield Hume School as a boarder between 1946 and 1951, and it was over half a century until he paid us a return visit. On a remarkable evening in 2003, Al spoke in this room about his upbringing, his time at the school, and his long career in public service. This paved the way for an annual lecture that has given the platform to the likes of the Right Honourable Claire Short, John Verge, founder of The Big Issue, and war crimes judge Howard Morrison. With each guest speaker, we have tried to challenge and provoke a CHS audience. Alf's own story is extraordinary. He was born into a half-Jewish family in Prague in the years leading up to the Second World War. By 1938, the Allies, pursuing an ill-considered policy of appeasement towards Hitler, bargained away the Sudeten land and in doing so, opened the door to a full invasion of Czechoslovakia. The tanks rolled into the Czech capital and six-year-old Al's carefree childhood was soon to come to an end. Al can vividly, re vividly recall being required to find a picture of Hitler to stick into his school book at primary school. This was merely the beginning. Before too long, the roundups and deportations would begin across occupied Europe. The concentration camp system was in full swing and storing up an ominous, an ominous fate for Jews across Europe. On many levels, the story of Al's survival is remarkable. He was one of the 669 Czech Jewish children who managed to escape Hitler's murderous clutches thanks to the Kinder Transport, organised by the British Schindler, Nicholas Winton. Nicholas Winton is an extraordinary individual who managed to save the lives of many. His life-saving made even more extraordinary by its accidental nature. Winton happened to be passing through Prague in 1938 on the way to a skiing holiday. It was while staying in the city that he saw for himself the scale of the unfolding humanitarian tragedy, the influx of Czech Jews into makeshift refugee camps. The plight of these people far away in a foreign land became his mission. From that point on, he worked tirelessly, at first from his hotel room in Prague, and then from his home in London, to raise money, establish useful contacts, and to raise an army of foster parents back in the UK, all with the intention of rescuing as many of the Jewish children as possible. In a matter of a few desperate weeks, Winter was able to arrange the trains to collect Czech children from Prague Station and to transport them across mainland Europe, even passing through Germany, before arriving at the Channel Coast. Poignantly, Al can still recall his mother packing his sandwiches, who was too terrified to eat as he travelled across the continent. The Kinder Transport eventually reached Liverpool Street Station, with a total of 669 children making the journey to safety. Alf recognises his good fortune, as the last train, with 250 children on board, was scheduled to depart on the 3rd of September 1939, but never left Prague Station. Two days earlier, Germany had invaded Poland, World War II had been declared, the frontiers were closed, and an estimated 15,000 Czech Jewish children were to die in the gas chambers of the subsequent Holocaust. If a true test of greatness is the ability to act, and act quickly, when evil threatens to strike, Winton deserves to be considered a great man. He could have walked away. After all, many people did. But many years later, in a typically modest comment, Winton declared, it was just something I had to do. And this remarkable story was not recognised until the late 80s, when his wife uncovered the details of her husband's story in some old boxes in the loft. Winton had sought no recognition for his deeds back then, but belatedly, the story had come to life. Eventually, it was picked up by the TV programme, That's Life. All the letters. But back here is the list of all the children. This is Vera Dillant, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. 
and it was just so wonderful, so terribly, terribly touching. If so, could you stand up, please? British Schindler has now been recognised with a knighthood in 2002. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the rescues and Alf is helping to host a number of events and reunions. As he puts it, I would think that without any doubt I owe my life to Nicholas Winton. I think my chances of surviving and that of the others would have been pretty slim. Anybody who saved your life is by definition a great man and he's a phenomenal individual, one of the really great human beings. Al did not waste the opportunity he was given. In a recent meeting with CHS pupils, he told, him, he told them his motives for going into politics. If evil politicians could do such terrible things, then maybe other politicians, good politicians, could make things better. He has devoted his life to serving the public and campaigning for the underprivileged and oppressed. In a long and distinguished career, he has served as a local councillor in London, as an MP, as a government minister, and as a chairman of the Refugee Council. Al has also played a significant role during the 1990s peace process in Northern Ireland under the Blair government. Respected and well-liked by politicians on all sides, he has been described by Times journalist Matthew Paris as the most undisputably nice person I have ever met. In 1994, Al was elevated to the House of Lords, Lord Dublin of Battersby. He remains an active parliamentarian and is also the provider of much sought after work experience placement for CHS pupils. Megan Randalls, who helped with last year's introduction, is currently working for him and reports Alf Dubs is involved in or chairs numerous all party groups, especially on foreign affairs. He recently returned from a trip to the Far East where he visited five countries in four days, including Japan and Taiwan. He spent time putting gentle pressure on governments to abolish the death penalty. He's achieved many small but important things over there such as arranging for Japanese prisoners to get trainers so they can play football. Alf very much approves of this year's choice of guest speaker. As someone who's dedicated his life to political activism, Peter Tatchell more than adequately fits the bill. Much of his career has been, gone, has been defined by his work on behalf of LGBT rights, but it would be unfair to pigeonhole him to that one issue. Born in Melbourne, Australia, Tatchell became active in politics at secondary school when he campaigned on the issue of land rights for Aboriginal people and helped set up a scholarship fund for, at them for his school. He also led campaigns against the death penalty and against Western involvement in the Vietnam War. By the time he moved to London in the early 70s, Tatchell was already something of a political veteran. From this point on, he quickly established himself as one of the country's leading activists in the Gay Liberation Front. He organised sit-ins and protests and was even arrested by the secret police in East Berlin for staging a gay rights protest, the first ever in a communist country. This philosophy has motivated his dedicated struggle to support victims of HIV and AIDS and the Foundation of Outrage, the prominent gay rights pressure group. More widely, however, he has campaigned on numerous other rights issues against human rights abuses in Zimbabwe, on the struggle for democracy in the Middle East, against the rise of the BNP, in favour of animal rights, on behalf of the Green Party, and even in support of, in, of the independence of Cornwall. It would be fair to say Peter Thatcher has been a polarising figure over the years. His willingness to engage in direct action has caused much controversy, 
such as when he challenged leading figures in public life to tell the truth about their sexuality. In 1988, he even interrupted the Archbishop of Canterbury's Easter sermon in the Canterbury Cathedral, condemning the Archbishop's advocacy of discrimination against lesbians and gay men. Indeed, his critics in Parliament and the press have gone as far as to denounce him as a homosexual terrorist and public enemy number one. Peter Patchell is without doubt one of our most interesting and challenging political activists. <coughs> like Dubs and Winton, he has proved that an individual can make a huge difference by standing up to be counted and sticking by their convictions. The three men have seen and experienced inequality and injustice, and instead of being passive, they have been active and made a significant difference through the medium of politics. It is with this in mind I would now like to invite our speaker, guest speaker, Peter Patchell, to deliver this year's Dubs lecture on human rights law, great in theory, not so good in practice. Thank you, Charlotte, for that very generous, warm introduction. Very much appreciated. I'd like to start by paying tribute to our dubs, um, whose politics uh, was very much influential on me uh, when I stood as a Labour candidate in 1983 in the Bermondsey by-election. Um, I didn't succeed. Uh, Elf did and had already. Um, and his work as a tireless campaigner for the poor and the marginalised is an inspiration to me and many others. He has been an outstanding public servant, uh, a true champion of people everywhere who seek equality and justice. So please join with me in paying tribute to our doves. I chose as tonight's theme the limits of human rights law. Great in theory, not so good in practice. Um, I think we all know that after the Second World War, in reaction to the horrors of Nazism, the international community collectively agreed to put in place a framework of laws that would seek to ensure that such abuses never happened again. That out of that horrendous experience, we would strive as a common humanity to build a better world where the rights and freedoms of all people everywhere was respected to give them redress, to act as a constraint upon governments that sought to override the rights of the individual. And so, since the Second World War, we have seen gradually, slowly, cumulatively, uh, the passage of various international human rights conventions designed for this very purpose, to protect the individual, to halt oppression, to enshrine the principles of freedom and liberty. Now, we all know the international covenants, most notably the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, agreed in 1948 by the newly formed United Nations, signed up to by every member state. Uh, a convention, a declaration that guarantees equal treatment and non-discrimination to every person on this planet, without exception. And since then, we've had further international conventions, the Geneva Conventions against war crimes, the Genocide Convention against mass extermination, the Convention against torture to outlaw abuses and mistreatment of people in detention. Here in Europe, we have the European Convention on Human Rights, enshrining the same kinds of comprehensive principles of equality and non-discrimination for all the peoples of Europe. And these are great historic monuments to civilization, to enlightenment, to the evolution of human society, to the point where we recognize that there are limits on what the state should be able to do. The rights of the individual are paramount and that certain rights 
are inviolable, inalienable, and beyond the contravention by any government, whether elected or dictatorship. So we have this vast body of law, but of course there are three major flaws. You know, you look at these documents, they're fantastic. You know, they are monumental, historic, inspiring statements. Yet there are three great flaws about them. The first is their limited scope. You know, there are, in terms of the explicit statements, limits on what is covered. So whether you take the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or indeed the European Convention on Human Rights, either way, there are certain classes of people who are not explicitly protected. So for example, neither of those documents have any explicit protection for people with disabilities. Neither of them have any protection for people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And looking to the future, neither of these documents have within them any protection against discrimination based on genetic inheritance. You may ask what that's about. Well, as science becomes more and more knowledgeable about genetic influences for certain behaviours or diseases, we are likely in the future to see growing pressure for discrimination against certain people because they have genetic predispositions to certain kinds of diseases. This is a really big threat to civil and human rights in the future. Um, we're likely to see, for example, insurance companies trying to up the premiums on people who perhaps have a predisposition towards heart disease or diabetes or cancer. And I think this is a very, very dangerous, threatening uh, aspect of future discrimination. And it is not explicitly protected against in any of these human rights conventions. Now it's true that most of them do have explicit protections based on race, gender, language, ethnic origin, even marital status and age. <coughs> but they do, at the end, also have usually some phrase like other status. And other status is gradually, slowly being interpreted to include the unspoken categories. So other status is now being interpreted to cover sexual orientation or disability in a way that never happened in the past. I can remember in the 1980s, there were, I think, five cases brought by lesbian and gay Britons to the European Court of Human Rights to overturn various discriminatory laws and practices in this country affecting LGBT people. Every single case was rejected by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg on the grounds that there was nothing explicit in the European Convention to protect LGBT people against discrimination. You know, roll forward two decades, and now we see the judges having taken, since 1999, a different interpretation, arguing that sexual orientation discrimination ought to fall within the protected category of other status. So there's been an evolution in terms of European Convention case law to recognise that sexual orientation discrimination is illegal, unjust, and has to be changed. And that is why in this country, in 1999, we saw a successful case brought by four lesbian and gay service personnel from the British Armed Forces to challenge the ban, to overturn the ban on lesbian and gay people serving in the armed forces. In 1999, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that the ban on lesbian and gay service personnel was illegal. And as a result, the law was changed. Uh, shortly afterwards, the European Court also ruled that the unequal age of consent for sexual relationships between men 
was unjust, illegal, and had to be changed. And likewise, legislation was brought forward to equalize the age of consent for everyone. So there is an evolution in case law, um, even though the actual wording of these conventions has not officially been changed. And that's a good thing. But those are flaws in the existing conventions. They are limited in the explicit protections they offer. The second major flaw, I think, is that these conventions are primarily focused on issues of liberty and equality, not on matters of economic or cultural rights. And I would argue that human rights are not merely about the right to protest or freedom of religion. They are also about the right to food and clean water. You know, those are human rights as much as the right to free speech. And one notable evolution, of course, uh, is in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which has sought, through the United Nations, to widen the concept of human rights beyond these freedom and liberty issues to the issues of economic rights, cultural rights, and social rights. The right to shelter, the right to food, the right to education, the right to health care. These are human rights, even though they are not always recognized as such. And I think this is another area where the human rights agenda or the human rights conventions need to be more comprehensively and clearly expanded to acknowledge that the rights, these basic um, matters of life and death in many cases, are as much human rights as the right to protest. Um, I have on the table before me a glass of clean water. I took a drink knowing that it will taste okay and that it won't kill me. But nearly one billion people woke up this morning with no safe, clean drinking water. Nearly one billion. Many of them had to walk miles to a dirty water hole to get water that is often contaminated and which is killing them and their children. Tonight, and every single night, somewhere around the world, 10,000 parents will be grieving for a child who has died today, this very day, from drinking dirty drinking water. You understand my point. The right to clean water, the right to food, is as much a human right as the right to protest. How can you exercise your right to free speech or the right to protest or the freedom of expression if you're dead from dirty water or hunger? And the final aspect, the third element of the deficiencies in human rights law is I think the way in which we have these fine, noble sentiments expressed in these human rights conventions, but so often they are not enforced. All around the world, in almost every country, there are abuses of human rights going on right now, including in this country. And that is the great challenge, perhaps the biggest and most important challenge right now, is to make these human rights laws enforceable to give them effect, to ensure that they're not just nice words on a piece of paper, but they are meaningful, effective remedies for victims of human rights abuses. It's interesting the way in which, when it comes to the enforcement of human rights law, it's mostly only small fry human rights abusers that get dragged to court. In recent years, there have been a number of officials from Rwanda, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who have gone up before human rights tribunals over human rights abuses. And quite rightly, they did or colluded with terrible acts of terror and killing. But what is disturbing is that the really big abuses of human rights in the world 
the big powerful people who do some of the worst abuses are never taken before international human rights tribunals. I'm thinking, for example, of President George W. Bush, who presided over the establishment of Guantanamo Bay, a detention centre where the rule of law no longer applied and where prisoners have been held, often without charge and certainly without trial, and often even without proper evidence for many, many, many years and subjected to a regime that is quite clearly dehumanizing, degrading, and against the basic principles of a democratic state. In the United States itself, they would not be able to hold prisoners in those kinds of conditions. But they're doing it, still doing it, in Guantanamo Bay today, despite President Obama's promise way back when he was first elected that he would close Guantanamo Bay within a year. We also have seen President George W. Bush introduce the policy of extraordinary rendition, where people are literally kidnapped and taken to third countries where they are tortured in the name of fighting terrorism. People in many cases kidnapped and tortured on the flimsiest of evidence which would never stand up in a British or American court of law. And our own government has colluded with that extraordinary condition, allowing overflights and facilities for those flights uh, that have taken place. Indeed, we know that in many instances, MI5, our security services, acting in our name, have known about and colluded with the torturers of these people. Now, I'm all in favour of bringing to trial and punishing people where there is evidence that they have been involved in acts of terrorism. I wholly support that. But it must be based upon evidence, not on supposition or circumstance, and not based on torture. Because so often, as we know, torture will produce confessions because the person has been so degraded, has suffered so much, then in the end they will say whatever their interrogators want. It is a very weak and very ineffectual way of getting reliable evidence. Another big human rights abuser, you may demur, but I think that Ariel Sharon's role as leader of the Israeli Defence Force and in his period as Israeli uh, Prime Minister sanctioned a whole series of actions against the people of Palestine, which amounted to human rights abuses under international law. But he's not in the dock, just like George W. Bush hasn't been put in the dock. Likewise, Vladimir Putin in Russia. You know, I am no champion of the Chechen militants, but the human rights abuses perpetrated by the Russian state with Vladimir Putin's personal authorization in Chechnya, amounted to mass gross human rights abuses. He's not in the dock. Closer to home. We never saw a trial of James Callaghan or Margaret Thatcher, the two prime ministers of this country who presided over grotesque human rights abuses in the north of Ireland. We all know that Amnesty International the government's own Compton Committee and a whole range of human rights organisations declared that Britain was using torture in the north of Ireland. Torture contrary to international law. That was sanctioned at the highest level by those two prime ministers. We pride ourselves on being a democracy. Yet we as a nation, our government, sanctioned the use of torture against people again on the flimsiest of evidence, evidence that would not stand up in a court of law, in many cases, in some cases it might, but in many cases would not, which is why these extraordinary procedures were used. Many of you will be old enough to remember internment without trial in Northern Ireland, where people on the mere suspicion of Republican sympathies or associations were interred without trial in Longkesh internment camps. 
These were human rights abuses, contrary to international law, perpetrated by our government in our name. And no one has ever been held accountable for those actions. So what I'm trying to highlight here is the selective nature of the enforcement of international human rights law. That it really depends on how big and powerful you are. Not on the evidence against you or what you may have done. And that really is a serious major, major flaw. Many of you will know that I twice attempted a citizen's arrest of President Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe. Um, that came about because I was approached by human rights defenders in Zimbabwe who asked me to try and do something, do something dramatic, they said, to highlight the human rights abuses happening in our country. In the late 1990s, the press in this country and around the world hardly reported a word about the human rights abuses that were already happening in Zimbabwe, long before the attacks on the white farmers and the seizure of black farms as well. Long before that, there were already human rights abuses happening in Zimbabwe. People were already being arrested and detained without trial, being tortured and occasionally being killed. And no one seemed to give a damn. So I hit on the idea of using international human rights law to try and bring Mugabe to justice. Um, I focused on the United Nations Convention Against Torture, 1984. Under that convention, which is incorporated into British law, under section 13, sorry, 134 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988, under that convention, anybody who commits an act of torture anywhere in the world, or who is a state official who condones, acquiesces, or colludes with an act of torture, can be arrested and tried in any signatory state. Britain is a signatory state, so President Mugabe or anybody else who was involved in acts of torture can be lawfully arrested and tried in this country or indeed any of the 140 plus other countries who have ratified and incorporated that convention. So I got from Amnesty International a dossier on the torture of two journalists, Ray Choto and Mark Chavanduka, two journalists who worked for the Standard newspaper in Harare who had been arrested in January 1999 and subjected to grotesque tortures by military interrogators. And I found the evidence that President Mugabe had gone on record publicly as saying more or less that these men got what they deserved. They got off lightly. That they should have, he implied they should have suffered even worse torture. And in terms of the statute, um, quite clearly, that was a reliable, um, responsible and effective basis for him to be charged and prosecuted. And then I decided to use the power of citizen's arrest. As we all know, under British law and the law of many countries, a private citizen has the right to arrest someone, anyone, if they have good evidence to believe that person has committed a crime. So I had the evidence that President Mugabe had colluded and acquiesced in the torture of these two black journalists in Zimbabwe, I had the dossier, had all the information, I decided to do, or try to do, a citizen's arrest. But of course, then the problem was when and how. Uh, I was not foolish enough to think that I could go to Zimbabwe and try and do this, because even by then, many of the judges would be nobbled by his regime. So it was a matter of trying to find when and where on a visit to Britain or another European country or the United States where I might seek to seize him and get him arrested. Um, I waited many months. Then in late October 1999, at around about midnight, I had a call out of the blue from a man speaking in a very thick African accent saying words to the effect, you might like to know that President Mugabe has just arrived in London from Paris. He is staying at the St. James's Court Hotel in Buckingham Gate near Victoria Station. 
He'll be flying back to Zimbabwe at 6 p.m. on Saturday from Heathrow Airport. Before I could ask any questions, the call hung up. I thought to myself, is someone pulling my leg? Is this a joke, a practical joke? Is this a wind-up? Maybe it's genuine. You know, the fact they hung up so suddenly gave us an instinct that this might be genuine. So the next morning, I phoned around to try and find people who might be willing to lay in wait outside St. James's Court Hotel and try and arrest President Mugabe. The idea was this, if he came out of the hotel down the steps to get in a limousine, we'd try and grab him. Or if he came out from the vehicle entrance in his limousine, we'd try and stop him in the street. Um, I've got to say, I've never heard so many excuses <laughs> proper. Reasonable excuses. Oh, I've got a doctor's appointment. Um, I'm off to Manchester for the weekend. Um, you know, I, I'm meeting my girlfriend. We have arranged to go for dinner together. Oh, excuse? Oh, excuse. Anyway, um, I think the main reason was people were understand to be afraid. You try and arrest a head of state, you're likely to face very serious charges, even if you're acting lawfully. Don't think for one moment that you can do a lawful protest and get away with it when you're taking on a head of state. Moreover, people were very nervous that the bodyguards might be armed and we could be shot. So in the end, I had three other volunteers. We three turned up at 8.30 a.m. on the Saturday morning outside his hotel with a photographer, a journalist, and a video person. The idea was to have media there who were independent who could record what happened, because we wanted to like, use this as a way of telling the world about the human rights abuses in Zimbabwe. And we understood that you know, we were doing something quite dramatic and dangerous, and this would be a good news story, and a good way of getting it in the news. Um, we decided to turn up at 8.30 in the morning on the assumption you wouldn't leave the hotel that early, um, and we just lay and wait. So we tried to look inconspicuous. Um, one guy stood in a phone box making phone calls. Another one stood at a bus stop reading a newspaper. Uh, I was looking in shop windows, and so on and so on and so on. But I've got to tell you, tick, 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 tick. After two hours, it's hard to remain inconspicuous outside a major hotel where a major VIP is staying. And sure enough, by about 10.30, we noticed that the concierge of the hotel, the guy with the top hat and tails, uh, started staring very intently in our direction, um, seemed to be talking to one of his colleagues. And I got a bit worried. I thought, you know, maybe he's suspicious about who we are, maybe he'll call the police. Um, and of course, if the police are called and they see me, they'll know, given my history, that something's up. So our whole plan was all pieces. To make matters worse, a few minutes later, out of the side entrance came five or six African-looking guys who were staring and pointing in our direction. I thought, oh no. These are probably Mugabe's security people, probably his bodyguards. The concierge has alerted them. They're suspicious. Um, what are we going to do? You know, this, this, the whole plan could go, go, go pear-shaped. What are we going to do? Now, in these circumstances, it is very difficult, no matter how much experience you've got, very difficult to think calmly and clearly. Um, whenever I'm doing something like this, despite the fact that I've done it about 3,000 times over the last 46 years, you're incredibly nervous. I mean, my stomach was churning over. I had a splitting headache from nervous tension. Um, I was shaking. I was, my body temperature plummeted. I was shivering with cold because of the fear of A, being discovered or the whole plan falling to pieces, B, being arrested, and C, I suppose, um, the fear that we might be beaten up or even shot by his bodyguard. Um, but somehow or other, in that moment, I suddenly had a brainwave. So I strolled straight across the road to where these bodyguards were standing, smiling and beaming, holding out my hand to shake their hand. I said to them, hi guys, I'm from the news of the world. These are my photographers and uh, reporters. We're here to get the big story. You know that Elton John is in the hotel with his new boyfriend. 
They looked at me like I was a madman. I said, look, I know that Elton John's in this hotel. We know he's here with his new boyfriend. But we've got to get the story for tomorrow's News of the World. The editor will kill us if we don't get the story. Please, please help us. And they all shook their heads and started speaking in Shona or never dearly, the Zimbabwean dialects. Uh, I said to them, look, I'll give you 50 pounds if you tell us what room he's in. I'll give you 75 pounds. I only had 10 pounds in my pocket. Uh, I said, yeah, I'll give you 100 pounds. Please, I'll give you 100 pounds. I'll give you 100 pounds each if you tell us which room he's in. Uh, Obviously, they weren't budging, so um, I then suddenly turned to one of them and said, Look, I know you. You can't deny it. You are in Elton John's security team. I saw you three months ago at his Wembley concert. You can't deny it. I saw you. Don't try and deny it. I know you're part of Elton's security team. You know, they started talking in the video show, and all started bursting out laughing. Then they just walked off. And I thought to myself, I think I might have convinced them. Sure enough, ten minutes later, out comes President Mugabe in his limousine. I scratch the top of my head to signal it's him in the car, and my colleagues further up the street run straight out in front of this speeding limousine. It screeches to a halt about six inches from their legs. Then one of the guys in our group runs behind the car, so it can't move forward and can't move backward. I run from the side, Open the rear car door. Amazingly, it is unlocked. And there before me is President Robert Mugabe cowering in the back seat. I held up this hand to show that I didn't have a weapon. And with this hand, I gently took his arm and said, President Mugabe, you are under arrest on charges of torture. Torture is a crime under international law. I am now summoning the police. You should have seen the look on his face. His eyes popped and his jaw dropped. He is very dark skinned, but a visible ashen pallor came across his face. To which I thought, now you know how your victims feel. Only we aren't going to kill you or torture you. We're going to take you to a court of law and you will have an opportunity to defend yourself according to the rule of law something you've always denied to your own people. The other thing that happened, of course, was that the bodyguard in the back with him, he cowered at me in the other corner as well. <laughs> but didn't pull a gun. I, mean, I, did, I, I was ready. If he reached inside his jacket, I was going to hit the, hit, the, hit the paper. But nothing happened. Anyway, we summoned the police. We explained who was in the car. We showed them the evidence. The police just knocked the evidence out of our hands and arrested us. We were arrested and spent the next nearly seven hours in Belgravia police station while President Mugabe was given a police escort to go Christmas shopping at Harrods. Now I believe, I haven't got the absolute empirical evidence before me, but I'm certain that what we did must have been reported to the higher authorities. I am certain that President Mugabe was allowed to return to Zimbabwe on the authorization of the then Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Paul Condon, the then Labour Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, and the then Labour Attorney General, Lord Goldsmith. They must have sanctioned his return. They must have had what happened reported to them, and they must have agreed to let him go. That was the biggest mistake of their lives, because in doing that, they allowed him to return to continue his reign of terror, which of course, three or four years later, became much, much worse. If Mugabe had been arrested and put on trial when we sought to arrest him, he would have almost certainly been found guilty and been imprisoned. And having decapitated the regime, taken out the main leader, putting him behind bars, I believe that Zanu Pieta's political party would have imploded. I don't know for certain, but I suspect that because of the rivalry and factionalism at the time, there would have been an internal fight and it would have greatly diminished the power and authority that they had in the country. So an opportunity was missed. Um, as I said, we did not succeed. 
We did not succeed. But boy, in the weeks afterwards, I got nearly 5,000 emails from people inside Zimbabwe. And they nearly all said the same thing. Thank heaven someone in the wider world cares about what's happening in our country. You helped put Mugabe's regime in the dock of public opinion. So it was a morale boost, a psychological boost for people inside Zimbabwe who thought they were forgotten, who thought that no one cared. And that moral support, that emotional solidarity of being aware that the wider world now knows about this tyrant, that was very important to many people in Zimbabwe. Of course, I didn't stop there. Um, in 2004, I brought a legal case in Bow Street Magistrates Court. I applied for an international arrest warrant to have Mugabe arrested on these same charges of torture. Uh, the magistrate, to his credit, gave me a full, but roughly, almost two full days for the hearing. At the end of the day, he ruled not that any of the evidence was wrong, he said that there was credible evidence of human rights abuse and that Mugabe was implicated. But he said, under the current statutes, namely the State Immunity Act of 1978, as a head of state, President Mugabe has absolute immunity from prosecution. To which I said to the magistrate, what is the point of having international human rights law if heads of state, the main perpetrators of human rights abuses, are exempt and beyond prosecution. We may as well tear up these conventions and these human rights laws. <coughs> Magistrates said, well, that may be, but he must operate according to the law as it is. So the application for international arrest warrant was, of course, denied. Since then, we have seen many examples where, likewise, the principles and spirits of these conventions have been ignored. Uh, for many years, the European Union has had a travel ban on President Mugabe. Yet, repeatedly, he comes to Europe and visits Europe. You know, I remember a few years ago, he attended the Food and Agricultural Association conference, the UN conference in Rome. He was allowed in because they said, well, he's attending a UN conference. So therefore, we'll give him a diplomatic pass. We'll make an exception. The same thing happened uh, when he attended the Francophone African Conference in Paris. Instead of enforcing the EU travel ban, the French, in the name of diplomacy, allowed him into the country and arrested me and others who protested peacefully against his presence. Um, as you know, just a short while ago, President Mugabe was allowed into Italy to attend the investiture of Pope Francis I. What's the point of having an EU travel ban if he is repeatedly allowed, with European government sanction, to violate and ignore it? Lest you think I'm one-sidedly obsessed with President Mugabe, in 2002, I attempted to also applied for international arrest warrant for Henry Kissinger, the former US Secretary of State, over his authorization involvement in the bombing of Cambodia in the early 1970s. Um, I had evidence, including from former National Security Agency officials, that Henry Kissinger had personally authorized, personally authorized and overseen the mass indiscriminate bombing of Cambodia in the late 60s, early 70s. This was carpet bombing on a mass scale, even greater than most areas of Europe ever experienced during the Second World War. And hundreds of thousands of civilians were killed, wounded, or displaced. In fact, some people say that as many as two million Cambodian civilians were killed, wounded, or displaced by this mass indiscriminate bombing. And under the Geneva Conventions of 1949, mass indiscriminate bombing 
is illegal. It's a war crime. You know, to not make a distinction between military and civilian targets, to bomb areas of civilian populations, to destroy churches or mosques or temples or any other place of worship, to destroy schools and hospitals, which is what happened in this American bombing campaign, those are war crimes. So I made the argument that Henry Kissinger should be uh, indicted and, uh, and an international arrest warrant issued for him. Again, to the credit of the magistrate, I was given a couple of days hearing. Once again, the magistrate did not dispute the evidence. Did not dispute the evidence. Um, towards the end, he said to me, Mr. Tatchell, I've listened very carefully. You've made a very persuasive case. But are you really suggesting that I should issue an international arrest warrant which would mean that the former US Secretary of State could be arrested and placed in Pentonville Prison? To which I responded, being somewhat prepared. I said, no, sir. Someone of his stature deserves something far more subtle and better. I understand that Henry Kissinger is very fond of Oxfordshire. I have here a list of estate agents with properties for rent in Oxfordshire, and I would suggest that he be detained under house arrest at a residence of his choosing. Um, unfortunately, the magistrate didn't buy it. Um, at the end of the day, he said the case fell solely on the fact he did not believe that I personally had the wherewithal to bring all the witnesses, to fund a full defence case, to bring all the witnesses to Britain to testify. So it wasn't about the facts, about what Henry Kissinger had allegedly done. There was no dispute about that, or at least he didn't express it. It was simply about whether I had the capacity. So I lost that case as well, but I tried. Um, there are so many other examples of human rights abuses around the world that go unpunished. Um, there is no prosecution of Pakistan for the annexation of Baluchistan in 1948. There's no prosecution of Indonesia for the annexation of West Papua in 1969. Um, the Sudanese leader, Omar al-Bashir, stands accused with a massive evidence that he perpetrated terrible, terrible war crimes and genocides in Darfur a decade or so ago. Yet he has never been put in the dock. This issue of heads of state immunity is an interesting one. The idea that heads of state are immune from prosecution by convention, and in our case, as a result of the 1978 State Immunity Act. In both the Mugabe case and others, I have argued that the tradition of head of state immunity is in fact not founded on principles or practice of law. I argued, in the case of President Mugabe, for example, that ever since the Nuremberg Tribunal, it was ruled that high government officials do not have immunity from prosecution when it comes to war crimes or crimes against humanity, such as torture and extrajudicial killings. That principle was established at Nuremberg and was applied in the trial of leaders of the Nazi regime. So that was the first major precedent. Since then, there have been many others. Slobodan Milosevic was indicted while he was still head of state of Yugoslavia. Charles Taylor was indicted while he was head of state of Liberia. Clear precedents for putting heads of state on trial for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Indeed, in Article 27 of the Rome Treaty, which established the International Criminal Court, it explicitly states that when it comes to war crimes and crimes against humanity, heads of state and other high officials do not have immunity. So you've got to ask yourself, if this is true, if these precedents are there, and if the International Criminal Court itself has ruled there is no immunity for these crimes, why has there not been an International Criminal Court 
arrest warrant issued for President Assad of Syria. The world is criticizing his regime. The world acknowledges the human rights abuses, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity, the indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas. Why has the International Criminal Court not issued an international arrest warrant for President Assad? That would seem an elementary, simple, obvious thing to do. Even if there was difficulty in enforcing it, which it would be, it would be difficult to enforce, the symbolic importance of issuing that warrant would be very, very significant. It would signal to not only President Assad, but to other tyrants and torturers around the world that the international court means business. That the International Criminal Court intends to enforce the laws that it is obligated and safeguarded to protect and activate. Um, why aren't we having UN peacekeepers go into Syria? Why hasn't the UN established safe haven? Why hasn't the UN established no fly zone? Of course, largely because two particular members of the Security Council uh, don't want it and won't assent to it. So why hasn't the General Assembly convened to vote on this issue? And even if it doesn't have the authority to activate all these things, to signal a willingness to do these acts strikes me as the obvious way to go. I don't know whether the General Assembly would vote by a majority to institute UN peacekeepers, safe havens and no-fly zones. But I suspect there's a chance it might. And even if only a sizable minority of countries voted that way, it would be a very symbolic, important gesture. It would signal to those who abuse human rights that gradually, slowly, the world is waking up and no longer is it prepared to look the other way while these abuses happen. That the world wants action. Now, at the end of the day, I do not support Western intervention. I think that the experience in Iraq and Afghanistan has been deeply flawed. But I also think that if there is a proposed action short of Western intervention, which has the sanction of the International Criminal Court, for example, the issuing of international arrest warrant, then the execution of that warrant is something that I would agree with and approve. Now you may say, how on earth is anyone going to execute an international arrest warrant on President Assad? He's not going to leave the country precisely because he fears such arrest. Well, I would say it may not be easy, it may be very difficult and fraught, but I would have a snatch squad go into Syria to seize him and take him to the Hague. It's not impossible. It's very difficult, but not impossible. You know, the Israeli raid on Entebbe, you know, the other examples of SAS rescue missions. Um, in very difficult circumstances, these raids have sometimes been spectacularly successful. Um, the raid to get Osama bin Laden. Very fraught, very difficult. But it succeeded. Whether you agree with the particular outcome or not, it succeeded. Why not do the same with President Assad? Not on the basis that the UK or Britain does it off their own bat. I would never support that. But if it has uh, the sanction of the International Criminal Court and there is an arrest warrant, then I would believe that any country has the right, indeed the duty, to do anything in their power to execute that arrest warrant, not only against Mr. Assad, but against other tyrants and human rights abusers as well. To conclude, as to the future, we need to really think about this issue, about issuing and actioning international arrest warrants against human rights abusers. Even if we can't make them stick, even if we can't make them effective in terms of actually securing the arrest, the symbolic importance is hugely important and should not be underestimated.
because it sends a signal to tyrants and torturers everywhere that the world is getting for them, that these human rights conventions mean something, and the world is attempting, at least, to try and give them force. I think it might make some think twice. I think it might make them perhaps hold back from some of their worst excesses if they think that one day there could be an international arrest warrant against them and that they might end up in the dock. But overall, I think we also need a new international United Nations Human Rights Convention, a comprehensive convention that will be enforceable not just in the International Criminal Court or in The Hague, but indeed in the national courts of any member state. So that anybody from anywhere who commits a human rights abuse can be tried in the national courts or the international courts. So once again, so the space of operation of tyrants and torturers is closed down and narrowed. I think we also probably need a permanent UN enforcement agency with peacekeeping and perhaps even in exceptional circumstances, military powers to protect victims of human rights abuses. Again, I would never favour a unilateral Western intervention, but with the support and authority of the United Nations, based clearly on international humanitarian law, I think that is acceptable in certain circumstances. But above all, we need to create a public consciousness and a global demand across borders that human rights are universal and that because we are committed to a common humanity, we will stand with all the victims of abuse everywhere in the world, wherever they are, and that we will seek to use international human rights law and international courts and institutions to bring the perpetrators to justice. That the culture of impunity, the idea that heads of state and other high government officials can get away with human rights abuses, we need to end that mentality. We need to send the signal from the people of the world that human rights abuses must end. That every person on this planet has a right to be protected and defended in their human rights. Thank you. arresting Tony Blair for the invasion of Iraq? Well, I'm a believer of the principle that no one should be immune from prosecution when it comes to war crimes or crimes against humanity. And that would include George W. Bush and Tony Blair. Um, the question is to establish with certainty what he knew and what he personally authorised. But certainly, we know since the war itself, it has come out there have been a succession of Iraqi civilians and suspects who have been killed in British military custody. Killed and tortured. Um, and those crimes which have been established, certainly the perpetrators need to be brought to justice. Whether they were the individual soldiers or higher ups in the military command structure, whether they were political leaders in London, that needs to be established. But certainly I think that the often indiscriminate nature of attacks in Iraq probably does provide a prima facie case for Tony Blair to be indicted. Growth strikes in Afghanistan, the question is. Well, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, the drone strike policy um, is really sort of a, a kind of high-tech solution uh, 
with often very, very grave consequences for civilians. Now, of course, you can have drone strikes that may be precision targeted and may only kill uh, militants and terrorists. But that presupposes that your evidence against those so-called terrorists and militants is accurate. And we've seen time and time again that it's often not. That uh, perhaps a site where um, militants or terrorists were has been duplicated by them, and the drone strikes that have gone in have ended up killing entirely innocent civilians. Um, there's been many examples in Afghanistan of people wrongly identified, often on the basis of having a similar name. Uh, wrongly identified for targeting, whether by drone strikes or by uh, military operations. Um, overall, I'd say that the drone attacks have been mostly totally counterproductive. The level of civilian casualties, the hundreds and hundreds of innocent civilians who have been killed, has actually fueled the insurgency and alienated Afghanis and Pakistanis from efforts to defeat Al-Qaeda and its offshoots. So I think the counterproductive nature and the unacceptable levels of civilian casualties makes drone strikes a huge political and military error. Let's get another question for students, if that's possible. How do you deal with someone who uses the human rights on the face of the shield by having a gun? Well, of course, the thing about human rights law is that it is for everyone including people who are actually quite reprehensible. But the true test of human rights is whether you extend human rights to ter terrorists, child sex abusers, rapists, and so on. That's the true test of whether you believe in human rights. All those people have human rights. They have human rights just as much as you or me or any law-abiding citizen. And this is the litmus test of a true democracy. Mm -hmm. That we will not allow our standards to be lowered or diminished by the reprehensible acts of others. That despite terrible things being done, we will uphold our humanitarian values. So for example, we do not, at least in theory, condone torture. Because torture is wrong. And one of the reasons why Abu Qatada is not going to Jordan is because the British courts have ruled there is a strong possibility that he will be tried based on evidence gathered as a result of torture. And since we are a democratic nation that does not believe in torture, that would not be acceptable. Um, I've got to caution you that the case against people like Abu Hamza and Abu Qatada is in some respects quite flimsy. I don't know if any of you know what the evidence is. Everybody I ask, no one's been able to tell me exactly what the evidence against these two men is. And the government itself, in many instances, won't tell us. It's vague ac accusations about condoning terrorism, acts preparatory to terrorism, associations with terrorism. Well, you know, that's all very well, but I won't actually see the evidence. I'm certain these are very bad people, no doubt about it. You know, I've fought against Islamism. Uh, and uh, terror tactics and jihad mentality, uh, which threatens above all Muslim people. But I want to see evidence. I want to see these people put in a court of law where the evidence is provided as it would be in any other case. With the case of Abu Qatada, uh, the government is making a mountain out of a molehill. There is no need to deport Abu Qatada. He should be put on trial in this country or in a third country, perhaps at the Hague Tribunal in the Netherlands. If there is a case against him, put him on trial. We don't need to send him to Jordan. Put him on trial. Or, if we prefer, we could establish a Jordanian court in this country or in the Hague to put him on trial. Why isn't that being done? It's a very simple solution, which if it had been actioned 10 years ago, would have ended the chaos and ping-pong toing and froing through the courts we've had for the last decade. That's the question we should be asking the government. Why hasn't Abu Qatada been put on trial? 
しかしてしきりでした。So tell you? Conquering great issues like dirty water, hunger, and malnutrition is easy peasy. Easy peasy. I think I'm true to say that the richest hundred individuals in the world have combined personal wealth of in excess of 250 billion US dollars. I may be slightly out there, but it's, it's a phenomenal sum. If they gave up just one quarter of their fabulous wealth to organizations like Oxfam,、uh, Practical Action, CAFOD, and other aid agencies, basic issues like dirty water and hunger could be solved in 10 years. If they didn't give up their wealth, well, they may not do that, but we could as a nation. Decide, or we could collectively, as a humanity, decide. Every year the world spends 1.6 trillion US dollars on arms and warfare. 1.6 trillion US dollars. If we could get an international agreement to reduce military spending by an average of 10%. And put that money into a global fund to fight poverty, that would give us 160,000 million US dollars a year. Check that number 160,000 million US dollars a year by simply cutting military spending by 10%. Within 20 years of that money, we could eradicate all dirty water, all hunger and malnutrition, all homelessness. We could provide basic education to every person on the planet. We could provide basic health care to every person on the planet. And we'd have money left over. We can do it. The problem is our priorities are wrong. We always find money for warfare. I can remember before the Iraq War, the government said, oh, there's no money to give pensioners in. We can't increase the pension. We're skint. We've got no money. Then along comes the Iraq War, and they find £6 billion pounds almost overnight. Where did that come from? Of course, the money's there. It's just we have politicians who've got the wrong priorities, and voters who put people into power with the wrong priorities. Use your vote to vote out those people in power. Who've got the wrong priorities, who think that fighting wars is more important than providing clean water. I'm afraid this is probably going to be the last question, so it better be a good one. No pressure on it. <laughs>、um, do you believe that direct action is the most effective form of protest? And if so, is it the fault of governments and state organisations if such protesters don't achieve their goals? Is direct action just justifiable? Career of direct action, Peter. Have you achieved anything?、Um, direct action, non violent civil disobedience and、uh, protest is not the be all and end all, but it's one method of protest, one instrument of social change. And we look at the history of this country, and some of the most important advances have been the result not of parliamentary initiatives, but of mass direct protest. I think of the Chancellors, the battle to win the vote for working class people without property. The suffragettes, the battle to win votes for women. Now, I know there w a s negotiations within Parliament, but I think the direct action protests were pivotal. Looking at other places further afield, India, you know, Gandhi's protest of non violent resistance. Refusing to pay taxes and rents, refusing to buy British goods, 
and the salt marches, those protests, completely peaceful, but direct action by millions of people, forced to its knees the British Empire, which was at that time the greatest military superpower in history. And as Gandhi said, we did not harm the hair on a single soldier's head. We did it peacefully. We won our independence through peaceful, nonviolent direct action. Look again at the black civil rights movement in the United States with Martin Luther King. An entirely peaceful protest movement that succeeded where the lobbying of Congress and the President had failed. Successive black leaders have tried to persuade Congress, they would lobbied successive presidents, but had not won progress in ending segregation and securing voter rights. But by mass peaceful violations of those segregation laws, eventually the United States had to change. Unless we think this is all history or far away, we must never forget the most noble, extraordinary achievement of recent British history was direct action. Margaret Thatcher introduced the poll tax, which made a millionaire pay the same as a low-wage office worker. The people didn't like it. The people saw the injustice. And millions of British people either refused to pay the poll tax or delayed their payments, therefore making the system unworkable, and then hundreds of thousands marched peacefully in the streets to demand change. Mrs. Thatcher said that policy was not negotiable. But the British people and their millions decided this was an injustice too far. And because of their collective action, we forced her government to change its policy and ultimately brought down her as Prime Minister. Um, whatever you think about that protest, it was incredibly effective. And I think that there is a place for quiet lobby. You know, I would much prefer to sit down with the Prime Minister, the Archbishop of Canterbury or whoever, and negotiate justice, peace and equality. But when that's not possible, when the people in power refuse to listen to reason, when they show no compassion, I think we have a moral duty to resist and protest. Protest is the lifeblood of democracy. Uh, there's no protest in North Korea. They don't allow that. And that's why that regime is imploding, and it's why that regime is so tyrannical. We ought to be mighty proud of the fact that, for the most part, with some flaws and imperfections, we do allow protest. And that is the strength of our democracy, because democracy is not just about voting once every five years in a ritual election. It's about the constant process of the people holding their government to account, through lobbying, letter writing, protesting, a whole range of things that people do to make their voices heard. Governments need to be held to account. That is the lifeblood of democracy and protest as part of it. So there you heard it, ladies and gentlemen, Gandhi, Martin Luther King and Mark, Margaret Thatcher, all in the final analysis. Very rarely the three people together. Can I just say one last thing? Um, if any of you are interested in my human rights campaigns, please go to my website. I've got, I've got my Peter Tatchell Foundation website, which is relatively new, or my more long-standing petertatchell.net website, my personal website, petertatchell.net. On it, it's got a vast range of news releases, speeches, articles, on a whole range of issues concerning social justice, global justice, human rights, and equality. Uh, I think you'll find it quite interesting, and you'll probably discover lots of things you never knew. Um, and if you're interested, you're most welcome to subscribe. Just click on the subscribe button, it's free, and then you can receive um, the weekly email updates about different issues. And you might find issues that really concern you and you might want to get involved. Um, also, because I'm um, you know, struggling to keep this organization going, um, I depend entirely on donations from well wishers. So if any of you um, feel you broadly support the work I'm trying to do, now, you may not agree with everything, but if you broadly support what I'm trying to do, please consider making a donation. If you can't afford to, maybe you know someone who can. Um, we're trying to get a thousand people to donate five pounds a month, which is not it's like the price of a couple of beers. Um, you know, that would really help sustain our work because 
we are helping hundreds of individuals in Britain who come to us with um, personal crises around child custody, asylum, um, discrimination, hate crimes, uh, mental health issues, uh, people who have been unjustly and wrongly convicted in the courts. We, we help them all in addition to all the campaigns we do for free speech and the right to protest in this country and the international humanitarian work as well. So please think about it uh, and, and spread the word. But it's been a great honour uh, speaking with you today. I, I'm, I've been very uh, grateful to be able to deliver this uh, lecture uh, in the name of Elf Doves. I just leave you with one final thought. My motto is, don't accept the world as it is. Dream of what the world could be, and then help make it happen. Thank you.